So two things to start with, since everyone's sharing their Hogan's profiles today. When Richard asked me if I would do this, well, actually, to be fair, if you look on your programs, there should be three of us here. <laughs> so you're probably wondering what happened to the other two. One is my boss, and he had an operation on his shoulder yesterday, very conveniently. And my other colleague has gone to Switzerland today, very conveniently, which is why I'm here. So we accepted jointly, and said we'd come and do this. Um, but seriously, this, so my, my high recognition value went great. I get an audience, I get to be a bit famous. My high dutiful, I can't say no, so I just said yes. <laughs> and then my low seven score adjustment went, oh, what am I doing? <laughs> so, um, so we, if you all suffice. So that's, um, that's my hope for a question. Um, just a little observation, I suppose, on the marketing piece. So I spent, um, a, that I think relates quite well to the, the, the subject today around using research um, in employee recruitment and development. So in my uh, consumer days, looking at consumer branding, we, we wouldn't really go anywhere without a consumer study. First thing we would do is look for insights before we did anything. Um, and I think when I moved into the HR team, looking at talent acquisition, and looking at development, I think the thing that was lacking for me was I didn't really have any objectivity to work with, didn't have any, any substance. It was, you know, my, my days, 20 years recruiting people, we'd get to the end of the process and say, did you like him? And, yeah, I like him, didn't like him. And it was very subjective. So um, I was really glad to be introduced to the Hogan's tools because I think they've given a huge amount of objectivity to what we do. So, um, as Richard said, what, what I'm going to do is just, it, I've put the book there, it's a bit of a story. Um, it's not best practice, take from it what you will, um, and hopefully you'll, you'll find something interesting in there for you. I think I've covered who am I, which I ask myself daily, who am I? I'm here today doing this. Um, I'm going to talk about a little bit about mining so that you get a sense of the organisation that I'm part of. Um, and, and why we've kind of arrived at where we are, and then talk to you about what we've done. Um, and I'm also going to tell you about some learnings along the way. Is that slowly drooping down? <laughs> okay. So this is who, who we are. Um, so Twining's over. We only, we only ever call it Twining's, but it is Twining's over. So um, I don't know how many of you know, but we also own the Oval Team brand um, and have done since 2002. Um, part of the Associated British Food Group. Um, I'm delighted to see so many colleagues here today um, from around the group. Other brands that you might know within um, the, the kind of more consumer um, arena would be brands like Rivita, Jordan's, um, Primark. I've got colleagues here today from ABI Group, which is our um, <laughs> which is our agricultural. We've got milling. We've got ingredients businesses as well. So a really diverse diversified group quite intentionally, um, but centred around food, ingredients and retail. Um, quite a large company, as you can see, 12.3 billion pounds, um, and over 100,000 employees in 47 countries, which is growing all the time. Talked about some of the varied interests, so we've got sugar, Primark, Maori, um, and I think the interesting thing about us is we are, we are so deliberately not like a big Unilever. I don't think there's anyone here from Unilever today. So we're deliberately not. Um, the point is that we have a very small centre with very few central processes. Um, and then we have very autonomous divisions. And the, the point being, so our, our chief executive, George Weston, I think he's chief executive. Yes. Um, he, his view is uh, we, you know, we have to know people, um, hence some of the stuff we talked about today, and we have to know about the money. And beyond that, we employ grown-ups to run our businesses. Um, and that's what we do. So it's actually quite rare for me to come across some of my colleagues. We only meet at these events because we do have very autonomous businesses that operate quite separately. Uh, this one. So this is where Twinings operates. Um, and the, uh, the yellow boxes where we have offices. So as you can see, we're quite, quite spanning the globe. Um, and the boxes with the little red around the, around the side where we also have factories. We've got over tea factories, we've got tea factories. Um, and again, very, these follow the same model. So the general manager in Thailand will run his business, he'll have an HR director. Um, 
the uh, general manager of the UK business has an HR function. So we are very, very decentralized in that sense. Um, and the challenge around building people processes into this is quite difficult um, because at the end of the day, the general manager in the business will say, I'm not going to spend the money on it. It's my business. He is profit responsible for his business. Um, so unless it's really about the financial processes, um, the centre has, has a very limited role in people processes. So just if you, if you don't know, if you know Twinings in the UK, you might not know some of the other brands. If you've come from overseas, you'll see that um, again, the UK product um, looks quite different. Uh, and again, it's another reason why we're not like a, like a we, don't, we don't have a brand like Dove or something like that that is the same all over the globe. We tailor the products to the markets that they operate in. Um, and the same with, with over team. How many people are UK based, you know, really UK based here? So pretty much all of you. So you may not know that in Switzerland we do biscuits with Ovaltine, um, in Thailand we do this white stuff with grains in it, but it's essentially Ovaltine is based on malt, so the product is, is very similar, but we've got some incredible differences. <coughs> Thailand is our biggest Ovaltine market. Um, and that brings me on to, to kind of our size. So um, Twining's over. In terms of share of hot, hot beverages, global, global hot beverages, uh, 1%. And our big co competitors, wherever we operate in the world, Unilever and Nestle, either through uh, products like Milo or through um, Lipton's Yellow Label Tea, um, they are massive for us. If we lose one person, in our, we're only three and a half, we're about 3,500 people across the globe. If we lose one person, it's like they're, they're losing, they will lose a couple of hundred to get to that. So it's vital for us that we hire the right people and we develop them well. Um, and that, that's pretty much what forms our philosophy on organisation performance. As an HR group, we focus on hiring the right people and developing people very well. Um, so we do make sure that we select people for our fit in our culture. Um, I mean, I'm sure, I don't need to tell you, but if, if you get fit wrong, it just doesn't work. And if you look back at, if we look back at the people that have not worked, it's largely been the fit. And we're quite a unique culture. We're, not everyone want, not, not everyone likes that decentralised, um, highly visible culture. There's, there's kind of nowhere to hide. Um, we develop people very early, and there's nowhere to hide. Um, we also want to be sure that we appeal to people. So we, we don't want people to make a very quick, rash decision about coming to join us. Um, and when I talk to you about how we use Hogan's in selection, you either want to go through that process or you don't. Um, we want to excel when we come to develop people. So, um, and I, I mean, I've seen Twines change a huge amount in the time I've been there. So when I joined 16 years ago, we didn't have an appraisal system. We didn't, I, I used to sort of do a bit of a review for my guys. Um, we now have a very robust and very rigorous personal development planning process. Um, with documentation that goes with it. But what that requires is for our HR people, remember they're not joined up in any central way, it, re it requires them to operate at a very high level. So we are not looking for HR people to come in and just do generalist stuff. We expect our HR people to look at organisational design, organisational development. We want them to be excellent coaches. Uh, we want them to be a lot of things. Uh, we put a lot of effort into developing the capability of our HR people. Um, and that goes for the tools, which is why um, we have selected the, the Hopin's tools to use in, in this process. Um, and we do try to give the best training and the support, um, which I'll talk about in just a minute. Um, so, two things. But as Richard said, we've been working with Mentis and Hopin's for about the last year and a half. We have been using Hogan's a little bit before, um, but, but not in any great way. Uh, and in the last year and a half, we've really focused on that. So phase one was all about building capability, um, but starting quite small in the centre, um, and then pushing it out to all of the HR managers. And phase two, which we're really only just beginning to move into, is getting fantastically good at world-class development plans, and, and that's just starting. So, hiring the right people. Um, I'm going to go back to my days as a functional manager, head of function. Um, it was my nightmare. Um, 
when someone left or I had to recruit someone, it got in the way of doing the day job. So my usual call was just um, bring up the lady in HR or whoever it was and just say, get me someone else now. Um, this, you need to be able to do this, this and this, and go. I was always had the question about who was the right person, who was the right fit. Um, how did we validate what we saw? So it's, it's, it's easy enough when, when you're recruiting a marketing professional to be able to see if they actually know something about marketing. It's less easy to know how they're going to perform and how they're going to fit in the team. Um, how do we separate someone, um, sorry, how, how do we separate what they can do and how they do it? So I guess that's the point about, about fit as well. Um, and how do we build subjectivity into personal attributes and fit? So I always ended up with more questions, um, but more than anything, I just wanted to get on with the process and get someone hired. Glad to say I've kind of changed my view of that now. Um, and this is something I did uh, at the start of a project two years ago in, in my new role now. So I've moved into the centre and my, I have this in my title called talent acquisition, even though I don't do a huge amount on a daily basis, I suppose I set strategy for talent acquisition. Um, and I do a bit of a review to try and see who's doing what. So these are all the different countries I looked at. Um, and those are the various um, steps that we find we need to go through in, in a recruitment process. And I asked the HR managers, it's quite subjective, but I asked them to rate where they felt their capability was in all of those areas. Um, and you can see that the, the largest amount of yellow and red is in that middle area of um, psychometrics, assessment, um, building that into the interview process, how do I assess for potential, how do I assess for fit, um, and how do I analyse all of that to something that's, that's really quite clear and, and um, has, a, has a good criteria for selection against it. Um, so what I then did was to... Yeah, okay, so, so that we distilled the, the five steps and um, decided that we wanted to start using Hogan's as a measure to enhance predictability, some structure, and some objectivity. Um, and it was at that point that I started working with uh, Richard to design a workshop that was going to upskill all of our HR managers. So the first thing we did was we built in-house capability. So this was last December, and uh, we brought about 16 HR managers from around the world, HRDs and HR managers, um, and we brought them and stuck them in a room for three days, and uh, we trained them on the process. We said, this is now the minimum standards, these are now the minimum standards, um, and you now have the tools to be able to do that. Um, the great thing I think about doing that in-house was we were able to tailor it to our needs. Um, some of the work we did was to look at our value set and so we were able to have quite bespoke discussions around how would we map our values onto Hogan's. Um, and uh, I'll show you something a bit that, that Richard's done um, with ABF in, in general as well, around fit and mapping. Um, we were able to provide lots of tools and techniques that were common to all, such as vacancy briefs, um, designing success profiles. So something that we um, are mostly familiar with, Lominger, Lominger competences. So, we started to be using those, that's largely our, I know someone this morning was talking about um, potential, our, our measure of potential we largely put around uh, the Lominger competencies, the learning agility, um, and if we start with that one we're defining job profiles and vacancy groups and success profiles around the capabilities and the, um, the experiences needed, we're then able to go to Hogan and build in the personal attributes quite, and, and be really quite refined around them to the team, to the job, and to the business. Um, so we, we, we trained in the vacancy briefs, success profiles, and how to, how to build those. We also um, talked about competency-based interviewing, linking to what and how. So um, one of the things I, I was quite conscious of when I did my Hogan's training was, it's one thing to go into a feedback session with um, someone who, who has wanted, who's asked to do the profiles or has wanted to do them and give feedback and that's kind of what you get trained to do when you do your, your COVID consultation. It's quite difficult to then, that doesn't necessarily fit in an interview process because what you're not trying to, you're trying to do a bit of both, you're trying to validate what you think you see in the profile in this person as well as this feedback. So uh, we worked with Richard to develop a competency-based interviewing guide. Um, 
that helps the, the guys work on how do you develop, how do you look at the profile, how do I develop a hypothesis around it relating to this <coughs> job and, and this role and this person, and then how do I mine for information in a way that isn't just saying, um, you've got really low adjustment, so do you think you might be a bit moody in the office, because people just can say, no, I'm absolutely fine. Um, kind of let's understand what we're doing. So I mentioned about we, we want people to join us who want to join us. So it's quite a, it can be quite a long-winded process actually, and candidates can find it a little bit, um, a little bit off-putting. We ask them to take, before they even come for an interview, we can send them a link and they've got to do all these tests. And it, it requires quite a, you know, if, if they're doing three tests, three assessments, that could be an hour, an hour's long time to, to do that. So um, we do explain to them why we do it, and we do commit to feedback to every candidate, regardless of the outcome. Um, and the, the fantastic thing about that is that we feel that people leave the process if they don't get the job, knowing more about themselves than they did when they started. Um, and uh, that, that's the one thing probably was. Just probably worth saying that we don't use all three assessments for every single piece of recruitment, and we don't use the assessments for, for every recruitment. So if I'm talking about our factory staff, um, we wouldn't use Hogan's. Uh, we tend to use it for um, commercial, managerial, um, less so for admin and for, um, for production staff. And, it, and it's a sliding scale. You know, if it's a junior brand manager, we might start with the HPI, um, and if they join us, we might then do their, their um, HDS as part of their development plan. If it's um, a general manager, we will do all three. Um, and actually, it's at times we've got Richard involved to do some of the feedback. Um, so it's, it's just about assessing which is the right tool for the job. Um, I think another thing we've really encouraged is that the recruiting manager and the HR manager work together. So I'll take back to, to my point when I was a recruiting manager. Um, Ring HR, it's you, you recruit people, you, you sort someone, I've written the job description, off you go and get me someone. Um, we really encourage the HR managers to sit down with the line manager and build that success profile using the competency documents, using the Hogan's profiling, so that they're really clear on who, who it is that they're looking for. Because again, one of my, my experience would tell me when you get to the end of the process and you've got three people in a room and they're saying, um, well, I like him, I like him, I like him. And there's no agreement because what we find what we didn't do was really clarify what our expectations were up front. So that's a really key step that's changed. Um, and then what we do, finally, I think someone, I think Thomas might have mentioned it, someone mentioned it earlier on this morning. Um, you learn all this stuff about someone through a recruitment process and then they join and that's it. So we've added an extra step in which says all this good stuff that you captured during the recruitment process from their Hogan's profile from your validity-based interview, you must have something that you could put down on your onboarding document that alerts us for the derailers that might come or the, or the development opportunities. So we don't ignore them. When a candidate joins us, we will make every effort to draw them straight away to what their potential threats are so that we can build a really early success, early success plan for them. Um, and I think that, that's really, really quite a key step. Um, so this is just a, a visual really of, of one of the tools we use. This is our simple success profile. For good reason, the personal attributes and fit bit is the biggest bit. So that they are not all equal. Um, and these are the areas where once we've looked at what the capabilities and skills we want, um, we then go to, go to Lominger, go to Hogan's and say, well, what implications does that have for the person in terms of how they need to do their job? And absolutely, when we come up to the, the personal attributes bit, Hogan's is, is forms a really huge part of that um, in terms of being really clear on what it is that we're looking for someone. Um, this is d deliberately not able to be seen. Um, <laughs> it's quite proprietary. Um, but we've worked with uh, Richard and with Hogan on this. So we've taken the ABF fit model, which sounds horrible, but it's just a uh, ABF wouldn't, they wouldn't say they've got a set of values that we put. Every business has its own values, but we have an idea of what fit means to work well in ABF. Um, and we've taken that and we've matched that. I say we, I haven't done this since Jim Hogan's done it. They've matched the Hogan's um, profiling to these competencies. 
it's not a tick box exercise, and I think that's probably been one of the biggest watch outs for me in using Hogan's in recruitment um, and development, is you can't just go down a list and say yes, 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 yes. You have to use skill and judgment and discussion and interpretation. But it means that HR managers are not having to do that every single time fresh. They can pull this off, have a look through it, look at someone's profile, and it, it, it just shows some red flags against fit elements. Um, and then I also referenced this, um, this model that we developed, or Richard developed, to, to help HR people think about, or the, the, inter the HR manager who's doing the Hogan's interview, to think about how do I not just give feedback, but how do I dig for information in a way that is going to give me evidence of this person's behaviour. Um, so it's not kind of the, old, the age old, tell me about your strengths and weaknesses. Um, we've got evidence and we go looking for it. Um, and you know, the quote says, uh, some little pictures of us, I think in Marlowe two weeks ago, we had the second workshop. So this time last year we trained Hogan's. Uh, a couple of weeks ago we had a, what, an, an advanced course, I guess, on, on practicing Hogan's in recruitment and development, which was really based on loads of role play, um, loads of real case studies. Um, and I think the key thing I think for the guys was it just helped them <coughs> build confidence, because not everyone has got the opportunity to use this, and it's like using a language. If you don't use it, you can't, you can't express it quickly. Some of our businesses are quite small, so if they're only recruiting two people a year, they're not going to be using it, so it's important that we keep the momentum going with the HR capability. Um, and just, just a, a few, quite a few quotes, but the one that sticks in my mind is um, Richard and I have been doing some feedback for a general manager position, and we were interviewing a pretty big gun. You know, this guy was a, a serious contender and had a serious CV and a big career. Um, he didn't actually get the job in yet. <laughs> but he did, he, he did say to both of us, this is a, a fantastic process. I've never done a process like this for an interview. And I've learned a lot about myself. Thank you very much. And this is a guy that didn't get the job. So um, that was really gratifying. Um, so I'm gonna, that, that was the, what we've done on recruitment, and it, it's, it's a work in progress, um, but I do genuinely believe that it is, it is adding to our ability to hire the right people. If you, know, if you think about steps, um, it's changed the focus of it. It's not just um, a, a transactional thing that an HR manager does with, with the line manager. It's become quite strategic for us now. Um, and I'm going to talk just very briefly about our hypo development, because this is where my... Um, my mischievous colleague, Karen, has disappeared off Switzerland, and this is really her, her piece, Hypo Development. So, um, when someone asked the question today, who's got a Hypo programme, I kind of tentatively put my hand up, because we do talk about Hypos, and we have talked about Hypos quite consistently for a number of years. Did we have a really tight development programme off the back of it? I would say no, um, and I think we, we would look at our nine box grids, and we'd see where our people were, and we'd be saying, um, you know, so-and-so has been in that box for ages, and, and that was it. They would sit there. We didn't really have a focused program on them. Uh, and again, we're quite small, so three and a half thousand people. I don't know how. I honestly don't know how many hypos we've got in the business. But we, if it's if it's thirty or forty, we ought to be able to do bespoke development planning for them at that level. We should not need sausage machines to push people through. Um, and so what we try to do is exactly that. And this is a very. This is li literally. Hypo development planning on a page. So if you if you start over the far side, that's my my right or left. Um, first thing we do is we identify this. We identify the hypo's career aspiration. So I think we've been very guilty of just saying this person's a hypo and not really understanding what it is they want to do. Um, and uh, we, we take them down two routes. We think about is it a general manager route or is it a specialist, more function head route. Um, and then we will work with, um, with other people in ABF and we'll try and work out where there might be jobs that they might want to aim for. <coughs> um, this is the bit that is where Hogan's comes in again. Um, so we are, at this point, step two, having, having agreed what kind of role that they're looking for in the future, we work with them to identify their strengths, weaknesses and gaps. And that starts um, with a, a career conversation, which is some work that some colleagues um, at the Centre in ABF have been doing around building really powerful career conversations. But in order to inform that, we will have um, 
360 feedback um, for HPI, HDS, and MVPI, and obviously their performance reviews from, from a number of years. <coughs> what we're trying to do is to, is to break down their gap, their strengths and weaknesses in their technical and their behavioral sense. Um, and, uh, and so that's, that takes you through step two. Um, step three is around re-agreeing what the personal development plan is going to look like. Um, and it's, this is another thing we were doing two, two three weeks ago with the HR teams, was having got that information, um, how do we build a development plan that addresses all of those things in that bottom box, the technical and the behavioural aspects? And that's why I hope it's just been coming in um, fantastically great use at, at that point for people who are... Um, maybe struggling with some competencies and then understanding that they're struggling with some competencies because of some issues with, uh, with their behaviour and their behaviour um, can stem from, from what's naturally in, a, in their personality. And I think as, as so many people have said, what we're not trying to do at this point is tell them to change their personality, <coughs> to help them to get the best opportunity in the future by understanding what could go wrong. Um, and then we follow that through, uh, through the annual um, process, but they, they will be going, they go through a slightly different process. It's got a much, instead of the annual PDR process, this will be on the table much more, um, and this will be on, um, on many more people's agendas than just their line manager and their HR manager. So general managers in total come together a couple of times a year and we'll discuss hypos um, in terms of how we can move people around. Again, I don't, don't think you can read that, that's fine. So I mentioned Blumminger. Um, we use those competencies. We don't have a, a leadership model at Twine. We don't have a leadership model in ADF. Um, so we use the competencies to help us understand um, job competencies, leadership competencies. And we've been working with Richard to, again, map HPI, HDS, MVPI onto this. So what detracts, what supports. Um, Something that I've, uh, so next week uh, we'll have our leadership development workshop for our junior leaders. And again, what I found really useful in, in using Hogan's um, in that respect is, well, this, something we've done a bit differently this year actually is now that we've trained all of our HR managers, we don't have to outsource this anymore. They own the feedback, they own the discussion locally. Um, and what we do here is we have a 360 which has the competencies, so in these two cases, the competency is providing support or empowerment. And then, um, this is not a scientific map. This is my own map of HPI and HDS. Again, it's a bit of a shortcut for the, the HR managers to be able to deliver feedback around those competencies um, that may relate to behavioural aspects or, or, I want to say, deficits in personality, <coughs> inhibitors in personality. Um, and, and I think the feedback we've had this year in doing this with the HR managers only the feedback is the quality of the feedback has been fantastic because there's no way even with um, looking at my colleague Charlotte who used to used to run this program you can't do 20 people's feedback if you if you've never worked with them in the way that you can if you work with them and so it's it's absolutely elevated so the guys are coming to the workshop next week and I really feel that they know themselves incredibly well. Um, so finally, just some learnings and top tips. So um, be really clear about why business outcomes are not just linked to HR. My, my old hat on, HR puppy stuff. Um, it, so absolutely, we. I think I think a few moments when we mentioned psychometrics, I'm, I used to be included with why. Well, what? What are we doing? Um, and it's, we work really closely to define business outcomes to it in terms of um, our strategy around recruit, recruiting the best people and sustainable employment. Um, so be, be really clear about business outcomes. I think establishing the in-house capability has been fantastic because it's made it overall. Um, we can't walk away from it. We have to own that feedback. I can't have a feedback session with someone in a development discussion and then not follow it through or not be able to ground it in example in a way that if we use an external consultant to do that, that's great, but that person who's had the feedback, now only they know about it, it rests with them. So it's provided a, a really high level of ownership. Um, and my bottom out there is just pay attention to building confidence and knowledge. So we, we trained all the HR managers, we sent them back out, 
And I think it took a lot more effort than we expected to get the confidence to the course. Um, and stick at it, be single-minded, so we haven't changed course. We are going to keep on this track for a number of years now, to keep, keep training this in. Um, build into a process, so it's actually in our process steps for recruitment, and it's in our process steps of development, so there's no way that you can just walk away from it. Um, it is clearly defined in the process. Um, I really focus on the candidate and the delicate experience because it's their data. Um, so we've been very careful to be very protective of the data for people um, so that they have confidence in it.